I'm Brianna, and today on 10 Clinical Minutes, we're going to be talking about venous thromboembolism prophylaxis. So to start off, a few definitions. VTE is the abbreviation for venous thromboembolism. That basically means a clot that forms somewhere in the venous system in the body. There are a few different types of VTEs, but the ones that we most care about are DVT and PE. A DVT is a deep vein thrombosis, which is a clot that forms in the deeper veins of the body. These are bigger veins that have a more direct course to the vena cava. A PE is a pulmonary embolism, which is a part of that clot which breaks off and makes its way to the lungs where it can cause serious lung damage and issues with oxygenation. VTEs are a major cause of issues that we have in hospitalized patients, with 25% of all VTEs associated with hospitalization and 5 to 10% of all deaths that occur in the hospital due to PEs. VTEs are the top cause of preventable hospital-related death, and they add between $9 to $18 billion in extra cost to the U.S. healthcare system every year. So VTEs are a major problem, but the best way that we can treat them is to actually prevent them. Prophylaxis for VTEs include a variety of different options. We'll go through each of these one by one. So ambulation, simply getting your patient up out of bed. It's kind of hard to study this because it's hard to control it and make it consistent between different arms, and the definition kind of varies, but there have been some good studies, like a 2019 lit review, that saw that immobility is an independent risk factor for VTEs with an odds ratio of between 1.73 to 5.64. Graduated compression stockings, which basically apply different levels of pressure throughout the legs, have a good amount of evidence in the surgical fields, but not a lot of great studies with medical patients. But in, for example, a 2018 randomized control study, it showed that graduated compression stockings decreased the odds of DVT by an odds ratio of about 0.35. Pneumatic compression devices are the little sleeves that wrap around our patient's legs while they're in bed and intermittently filled with air. One study showed that Pneumatic compression devices can decrease the risk of VTE compared to no prophylaxis and compared to compression stockings. And then lastly, one that we normally think about is chemoprophylaxis, or using medications as blood thinners to help prevent VTEs. The 1999 randomized controlled Medinox trial was a landmark study in this area that showed that anoxaparin, which is a low molecular weight heparin, can significantly lower the risk of VTE as compared to placebo, with absolute risks of 5.5% for anoxaparin versus 14.9% in placebo. So how do you decide who needs prophylaxis? The PADA prediction score came from a study that was published in 2010 that classified patients based on different risk factors, which assigned different points. Adding those points up together classified them as either low risk or high risk. The authors of this trial found that low-risk patients had a VTE rate about 0.3%, so pretty low. But those that were high-risk had a VTE rate of 11% without prophylaxis, but that rate could be reduced to about 2.2% if they do receive prophylaxis. So if your patient has high risk, how do you decide if you need to prophylax them? Well, you need to consider their bleeding risk. There are various ways to assess bleeding risk, and one that many med students think of is the has blood score. But this is not appropriate for VTE prophylaxis bleeding risk estimation because this was validated in patients with AFib. So we're not going to even talk about it. It's not appropriate. One thing that is appropriate is a 2012 guideline published by the American College of Chest Physicians where they list a bunch of different risk factors and classify patients as low, intermediate, or high risk of bleeding based on the number of risk factors that they have. As you can see, the risk of major bleeding for the first three months or the subsequent time based on these different risk levels is laid out in their guidelines. So you need to measure the patient's benefit versus risk of chemoprophylaxis. So when it comes to chemoprophylaxis, we already talked about the Metanox trial, showing that heparin or low molecular weight heparin is a very effective way of prophylaxing. This trial showed that the 40 milligram daily dose of anoxaparin reduced VTE compared to placebo at 5.5% versus 14.9% with no major difference in mortality or major bleeding at 10 days. But one thing that's really important to note is that this trial analyzed high risk medical patients. So it's great that we're looking at medical patients, not surgical patients, but this did not address low risk patients, just those high risk. So for example, patients that with a PAUDA score above four, they didn't use the PAUDA score in this study, but they only looked at high risk patients. So what's the specific benefit looking at 
unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin. They're not the same. A 2007 meta-analysis of 36 randomized controlled trials compared unfractionated heparin and low molecular weight heparin to control. One thing to note is that the data in this table is compared to placebo. We are not comparing unfractionated to low molecular weight heparin in this table, okay? So the bolded blue text is the risk ratio compared to placebo. You can see that both unfractionated and low molecular weight heparin significantly reduce the risks of DVT and PE. However, they did both also increase the risk of major bleeding. Some studies did directly compare head-to-head -head unfractionated versus low molecular weight heparin, and that result showed that low molecular weight had a slightly lower risk of DVT and a slightly lower risk of injection site bruising, but there was not any difference between PE, mortality, bleeding, or thrombocytopenia. So in general, unfractionated heparin and low molecular weight heparin have about the same benefit as far as preventing VTEs. But again, really important to note, the studies included in this meta-analysis were of high-risk medical patients. We are not talking about low-risk patients here, which going back to that powder prediction score would be a score of less than four. So what about those patients? Well, there have not been any studies that have shown benefit of chemoprophylaxis in these low-risk medical patients. In fact, a 2007 meta-analysis of many different RCTs showed that the number needed to treat to prevent one pulmonary embolism was 345. That means you'd have to prophylax 345 patients with heparin or low molecular weight heparin in order to prevent one pulmonary embolism. Another study published in 2014 was a Cochrane review that showed an odds ratio of major hemorrhage of 1.81 with chemoprophylaxis in low-risk medical patients. That calculates to a number needed to harm of 336. So what these data are showing is that we have to treat 345 patients with heparin or low molecular weight heparin in order to prevent one PE, but we only have to treat 336 of these low-risk medical patients in order to cause one event of major bleeding. Those numbers are very close together. So looking at the comparison of risk and benefit, it simply isn't worth it for low-risk medical patients to chemoprophylax. So in summary, I'm not going to walk through every part of this table, but the thing to notice is that in any patient who is at low risk for VTE, you don't need to give them pharmacologic prophylaxis. So you do not need to give them heparin or low molecular weight heparin. What really matters is their VTE risk being high and then looking at their bleeding risk. So step one, what's their risk of clotting? You can go back to that powder prediction score or there's a couple other risk assessment tools. If they have a high risk, what is their risk of bleeding? If it's low, sure, go ahead, give them prophylactic heparin, that will probably outweigh the risk. If it's intermediate or high, you need to have shared decision-making with your patient and see what their concerns are, what their priorities would be. And for all patients, we want to do those non-pharmacologic methods like mobilization, ambulation, and intermittent pneumatic compression devices while they're in bed. Also, one thing to note is if they're already on anticoagulation, like a DOAC or warfarin, you do not normally need any additional prophylaxis. They're already being anticoagulated. And lastly, before we end, we've seen that with the COVID-19 pandemic, it seems that the SARS-CoV-2 virus is causing increased rates of VTE in these patients. In the blue bolded text over on the left of this slide, you can see that the general rate of non-COVID medical patients of VTE while they're on anticoagulation is about two to 5%. But if we compare that to the COVID patients, those on the wards have a rate of about 9% and those in critical care have a higher rate, closer to one in four having a high risk of VTE. And this is even with patients on anticoagulation. So in that blue table, you can see the amount of studies where these patients, where those percentages came from, a lot of them had majority, if not all of their patients on anticoagulation, and they still had those high rates of VTE. So the American College of Test Physicians and the International Society on Thrombosis and Hemostasis have published some guidelines specific to COVID-19 patients. They have the same recommendations for non-critically ill and for non-hospitalized patients, which really doesn't differ from other patients. But for those that are critically ill and those about to discharge, they do have slightly different recommendations. For the critically ill, the International Society on Thrombosis and Hemostasis does say that you can consider doing a higher dose than just the normal prophylactic dose of heparin. And they also say that after discharge, you can consider discharging the patient on heparin or a DOAC for up to 30 days if they are at high risk for clotting. And a lot of that comes down to just your clinical acumen and what you think is best for your patient. Here are some resources. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of 10 Clinical Minutes. Feel free to contact us with any comments or questions, and we look forward to seeing you next time.